You are listening to Missed Apex Podcast. We live F1. Welcome to Missed Apex Podcast. The title of today's show is... Oh no, you missed your appendix. That's supplied by Phil in the Slack group, and the runner-up was the Great Wall of Magnuson, provided by Chris in the Patron Slack group as well. Hello, I'm your host, Richard Reddy, and today we witnessed a slight distraction uh, from the Red Bull internal war as it took a two-hour break to allow us to actually watch some race cars, and it was chapter two of the 2024 season. It proved to be entertaining, if not ground shaking. We are an independent podcast produced in the podcasting shed with the kind support of our patrons and partners. We aim to bring you a race review before your Monday morning commute. We might be wrong, but we're first. I'm joined in the shed by Matt to Rumpet. Hello, Matt. And that'll be 10 seconds for you. And 10 seconds for you, and 10 seconds for you, and especially 10 seconds for Magnuson. But I started and then I quickly stopped again, so surely I'm okay. I did fluff exactly. up. I fluffed up the intro, so I hit the bumper on the live stream, then I stopped and did it again. Straight away in the live chat, Spanners pulled a Lando. Oh, that's why I often resist having a live chat. Um, understandably. And but as long as you don't trip the sensor, you're fine. There you go. Also joined from Canada by Christina Lee Mace. Hello, Christina. Hello. If you missed that little paw, Squeaks McGee is sitting right here. So we'll see how long he stays asleep, but he is here. Well, Squeaks can have a starring role because we are unfortunately missing Stuffy, so, who couldn't get Riverside to work, but that does mean that we're only a third Essex. So not the, not the pure Essex support that Oliver Behrman really deserved. But I'll tell you what, Matt, that, uh, apart from... Out front, it was a slightly entertaining race. I think it's slightly dampened by the fact that everyone was kind of hoping for something different, a little bit of a different order up at the top, and and maybe something to distract us from all the off-track stuff. Uh, But there was some interesting strategy, but it was ruined fairly early. Well, I mean, you say ruined, and I say Lance just saw his shot and took it. I'm not going to win the race, but I can dominate by doing this one thing. Classic start from from Lance Stroll there, Christina. And I think that's a, that's a good place to start because it's a very, very difficult um, 2023 for Lance Stroll that has led into a very, very difficult 2024. Absolutely. And the thing with Lance Stroll is that he's a very standard midfield driver. And at the end of the day, we really should only expect that from him. So... You know, having very forgettable performances probably would be better for him than crashing, which is unfortunately what he did here. So yeah, it's been it's it's gone on sort of a long time, Matt. You know, and he is sort of famed for his lack of spatial awareness on occasion. So how many times have we talked about just turning in on someone where it didn't even look malicious? It just looked like he wasn't quite seeing where his front wheel was. Now, now you have to sort of question. I know people hit walls all the time, but it was a really avoidable accident. Yeah, I mean, and all right, so I very much want to give him a hard time for this because it wasn't the kind of accident that was just an accident. It it seemed inattentive, like he nicked that wall where it's like it was kind of like the Russell thing in Singapore last year where he like smashed into the wall where it stuck out a little bit. But you are right. The, the cars are big. It is hard to see, but it just, I mean, how he's eight years into the sport. It's not the kind of mistake you would expect someone with his experience to be making very often. And I feel like I, I stick the knife in quite a lot with Lance Stroll, but I, 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 I know we've got Canada represented as well, so I need to watch my words carefully. But I, I do sort of feel like I'm semi gaslit every time, that every time there's something that's worthy of criticism and we call it out, Somebody says, oh, but you're just getting at him or they make an excuse or a reason for it. After eight years, it is mounting. Like, does Canada forgive us for for pointing these things out when they happen? Oh, absolutely. Quite frankly, there's nothing that Canadians love more than ragging on athletes that they absolutely adore. Take a listen to how (laughs) any Canadians talk about their absolute favorite hockey team. They have absolutely no problem saying, oh, wow, 
they absolutely bottled it that game they let us down and at the end of the day it's being a fan of somebody it doesn't mean that you should blindly support them and i say this as somebody that you know i support certain drivers rights and their wrongs but that still doesn't mean that i'm not willing to say this was a bad day for them and it's it's just unfortunate when fans of any capacity of any driver aren't willing to say no you know what this was a bad day this was a bad move and that's what happened today lance stroll just lacked that little bit of awareness which it's jetta you know it's it's one of those very very unforgiving tracks yeah so he, out of all people who does lack that spatial awareness, should probably have been going a little bit more conservative and should just be aware that that is his weak spot. It's the lack of awareness, not just for his car, but also that that's a personal failing that he doesn't account for. That's the real letdown in my mind. And I begin to wonder, like, like I, I got from that today, this is like, I got the strongest Maldonado vibe from him I've ever gotten. And I don't mean this in the same way that Maldonado just really crashed. But it seemed to me that his concentration, because I mean, this is early in the race. It's not a time you'd expect someone to be zoning out. This is not lap 47 of 50 and I've passed no one and no one has passed me. This is still at the start where things can happen. And it, he was distracted or not paying attention, but I sometimes wonder, he says all this stuff out loud. But I do sometimes wonder, like, how much does he really feel that in his heart? Just just a thought, you know, yeah, just okay. maybe some, still some leftover DTS. Yeah. So the punishment doesn't fit the crime. So slightly hitting the wall, I guess. But you know, on a street circuit, as Johnny and Palmer reminds us, you have to be alert. So moving on from that. Uh, and the reason I just I wanted to linger on that a little bit is because like we sh are way past the point now where we have to apologize for criticizing Lance Stroll now. So seven tenths of a second off of Alonso and it wasn't a freak there wasn't really any extenuating circumstances that was just representative of the pace and then stick it in the wall so if that wasn't the team owner's son you know they'd be getting they'd be really under pressure you know that's another wrecked car it's another missed opportunity especially with Alonso in P4 but Matt explain to us how the race was won and lost from that safety car point because everyone was waiting for a safety car and it came early it, well, yeah, this is a race that continues with its 100% safety car ratio. Every year we've had this race, we've had a safety car. And in this case, because it's a one-stop race, pretty much everyone drives around until the safety car happens, gets their pit stop in, and then makes the hard tires go to the end. Because looking at the Pirelli preview, they were capable. The hard tire alone should have been able to do the whole race without a stop. So there's, there was never going to be a lot of drama in this race. There was even less with the DRS. But with an early stop like that, yeah, it, it really limited the amount of strategic action we had. Didn't kill it entirely, but yeah. did limit it. And uh, Christina, I'm, I don't want to give up my machismo by saying that track scares me. So can you do it, please? That track scares me. <laughs> it gives me the heebie-jeebies, quite frankly, like up and down the spine. I feel quite tense watching a lot of it, especially we also had, <laughs> shameless plug here, F1 Academy <laughs> this weekend. Uh, yes. And watching their tiny cars and how much space they have on that track, it was so much more relaxing. And I was just sitting there thinking, this isn't as bad. They're not going as fast. They're not as big. This is great. Yeah. And then you jump into the Formula One sessions where they can't go too wide in the majority of the track. The corners are still blind for a huge chunk of the track, despite the fact that they did a whole bunch of improvements last year. And it is better than it was, but it still, it still makes me very, very tense. Yes. And you're not the only one. Remember Ollie Behrman's dad during qualifying? Oh His face when they almost hit the wall? And just like, I was like, as a parent, I was like, oh man, do I ever feel that? Yeah, I know. And I have to admit, like early on, when I first, when I first birthed and spawned children, I thought they're going to grow up. I'm going to push them into racing. And then it, it didn't take long for me to be genuinely seriously put off it. It was one where, where V spun across the track and then the lad just came in and absolutely T-boned her and just hearing you know, the crunch of your two little ones. And then later on in the day, they were sh they were sharing a corner and I saw my little daughter 
open the steering up very deliberately to run him into the wall so that she could stay ahead. And honestly, I, I think as a parent, it takes a lot of, like, we have to, how do you, I don't know how you park that, but what was really sweet was Ollie Behrman's dad seemed to be just living every single moment, every single turn with him. Yeah, it was one of the best parts of the weekend, really just getting to see his reaction in in the garage like that and thinking, man, can can you imagine your age, you, you, you know, like, I can't even imagine handing my 18 year old the keys to my car just to drive around on the roads, never mind a car that drives like that and then having to watch the result, nightmare fuel. Okay, so- Please tell me you guys are the parents that hold on to the car as your kids are driving and just hope and pray <laughs> that you're okay. Cause that's what mama Mace does. Even to this day when it's like, I've been driving for well over a decade, I've got this, it's fine. It is still the death grip as if that's gonna save her if I slip and slide. <laughs> like. uh, yeah, not quite there yet, but okay. So let's, that's a huge story. Obviously Carlos signs uh, his appendix. He seems fine. He looks, he looked really ill on Friday and then he's back in the garage. He looks like he's okay, but obviously not fit to race. So you dump in 18-year-old Ollie Behrman, who has not, obviously, that's his Grand Prix debut. It's, it's a funny one when it comes to a reserve driver that you take the kid from the pool who's currently doing F2. So you would, in the past, when we've seen the reserves jump in, it's been the likes of Nico Hulkenberg and Paul DeResta. And you sort of think, well, do you know what? They're old and ugly. Yeah, for sure. Just chuck them in on that Saudi Arabian track. We won't miss them if they're gone. Well, it just feels like, you know, well, they're a veteran. But then, you know, you chuck a, a kid in and it's frightening because as a 43-year-old, he really looks like a kid. Like, it's scary how much he looks like a kid. Like, he looks like a school child to me. That's more of a, a reflection of how old I am, I suppose. But you go, wow, that is maddening. Well, so we're just going to chuck this kid straight in with one hour's practice. So I'm not saying any reflection on whether that whether he did well or not, but I wasn't sure whether that was the right thing to do, especially at the at this track. So I'm kind of glad it went off without a hitch. But performance-wise, Matt, I think it's it's quite interesting that we see the difference between when they give these kids the FP1 practice sessions or the rookie driver tests. Like it's really clear that in those FP1s they don't turn up the wick, they don't give them all the toys, and then suddenly here FP3 go. Oh, yeah. Well, and of course they don't. I mean, who wants to break a car that expensive with a with a rookie in it? The amazing thing to me, really, is that because of the rules of the game, the car he got was essentially the one that signs set up because at the end of FP3, the car is going to park for May. So they would have had data during that session and they would have been able to adjust very little on the car to his taste. He basically got handed somebody else's cars, was told to learn the track in an hour. I think F2 races there, so he probably knew the track fairly well. And then they're like, oh, here, go drive the car as absolutely fast as anyone can drive it in qualifying after an hour's practice. It, it, was, it was amazing to watch. Yeah, I, I feel like in the olden days, it would have been easier for a rookie to come in and be on pace, and perhaps the overall standard isn't as high. Whereas now, nobody really expects a substitute to jump in and do really well so I, everyone was saying oh Leclerc's being really helpful he's being really nice about it and Leclerc does seem nice but you can imagine there are some teams where you drop in and they go like hey uh, what do you think you should do around turn four? Oh, oh, flat yeah 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 turn turn four flat yeah good luck kid you know off you go that's the old razor blades in the piano keys Juilliard audition. Oh my god, Man. Matt, yeah. that's made me. Yeah. That's made that me. kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, Ollie Berman. I mean, the, obviously, it's been spoken about a lot, but we can't underestimate the the achievement of just getting in there and surviving. So ordinarily, you'd say, well, P four because you've got the second best car. But today, wasn't it interesting on the on the radio and the and listening to, you know, the management saying to him survive kids and really like talking him down chill it was all right just chill out like is that the right approach well i was gonna say don't forget vassour has a long record with juniors too here oh yeah i mean he was he worked with hamilton when he was a kid he worked with a bunch of current drivers on the grid as they were coming up through the junior rank so in some aspects maybe bearman really did luck out because fred understands how to deal with people that age 
and how to put them at ease and give them the tools they need to be successful in an incredibly stressful environment, quite frankly. Yeah. So how do we rate him, Christina, overall for the weekend? Oh, just a fabulous job, especially he hasn't driven this version of the car yet. He hasn't had an FP1 session yet. So just on that, solid job. The finding out, by the way, you're not going to be doing F2, you're going to be doing F1 the morning of and then going for it. So just lovely to see him stay calm, to take it, to take everything that was just kind of thrown at him and to go with it. Just very solid job there. And yeah. he always stayed so calm on the radio as well. You could tell that he was just taking this as another day in the office, just kind of going through his paces. Their, their head spaces like, are just so incredible to listen to. He sounded quite excited at times that he was in the car. He was being self-critical. And I think that's also a good reason for Fred Vassar and the team overall to tell him not to push too hard because there's no telling these drivers not to push hard. Mm. They're going to do that naturally anyway. So if you at least pull back and say, no, we as a team, just whatever you do, you do. That's a fantastic perspective to take, in my opinion. All right. But looking at the actual performance. OK, so you're in there. You're in you're in the big kids league now. So we get to actually talk about what you did. Like straight away, I think it was uh, on, on lap one. He's trying to hang it around the outside of uh, a Williams. He then stuck his nose on in on Sonoda of all people as well. And, and I wonder in our leagues, Matt, when we do our eye racing and stuff, you kind of go, oh, that's that's Henny. He will kill me without a second thought. Oh, that's James Gill. I'd better break a lot later because he's going to try and come through my gearbox. I wonder if like it crossed Behrman's mind to go, that's Sonoda. Maybe I shouldn't just jam my nose in up the inside. But he gave it a good go and actually was able to withdraw in time to avoid it. But there was no gun shyness at all. No, that was maximum adrenaline, I assure you. Because later on, you could see him start to make better choices about his overtakes like he would be lining it up and you could see him going well i could probably try and insist on that but if i wait another lap i'll have it for sure but those opening laps but also understand he knew he had those soft tires and he had a limited very limited lifespan to try and make places up and he probably felt bad about not making q3 it was just unfortunate yeah. the way ferrari ran him and that that his first lap really got spoiled by the uh by the safety car and qualifying so so he was down a set of tires but yeah he did not leave very much on the table those first few laps and it was very exciting to watch from a hamilton fan point of view and look, I, t I take these there's there's two things one is the all-encompassing uh, friendly host and we yes i talk about my 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 biases but we try and be inclusive nearly uh, but then when it comes to like the twitter arguments there was so much fan leverage about Lawson coming in and then immediately knocking out Verstappen. Now, how did that work? Someone knocked out Verstappen basically out of the Singapore Grand Prix and he ended up not making Q3 due to due to his teammate. And you go, if a rookie had come in and knocked Lewis Hamilton out, I'd have had to have gone back deleting tweets. But he came very close to knocking out Lewis Hamilton and really compounding uh, Lewis Hamilton's uh, bad qualifying performance. So I think that was the most impressive thing. He had one run, basically one chance to practice on low fuel so yeah so it's hard to argue now that he doesn't justify uh, a future seat that's going to come up in one of the ferrari based teams uh they were talking about a house seat a whole lot in the post-race show on f1 tv so it wouldn't surprise me at all if today's um if today's performance might have changed his future in formula one for the better do you reckon that's why magnuson was absolutely on it maybe yeah could definitely be a motivator but they also do have six sessions with ollie bearman scheduled in the haas for fp1 already six so that is already a huge part of yes and they're okay. scheduled like which race weekends they're happening at not just oh we're gonna do six it's he's on the calendar yep so you they're, go and, they're getting them prepped so you go and do a good job at haas and then suddenly 2025 Lewis Hamilton and Charles Leclerc start to look start to look nervous and start to look at their performances. Um, OK, so definitely they're uh, one for the future. But actually, in this race, I think there were two fairly interesting battles going on, which was Hamilton versus the McLarens. But really, I kind of want to start with what was going on down at the down at the bottom end. OK, the, the Great Wall of Magnuson comment. 
so good. I was telling Christina before the show started that if the only thing that happened was that strategy from Haas, it would have been an amazing race to watch. I They nailed the strategy. Magnuson had to drive brilliantly. I mean, admittedly, he was a bit messy earlier in the race, and I guess we'll get to that later. But he his his pace differential once he once he cleared. And for the listeners, here's what he did. Once he realized he had the penalties, the team said, "Look, you've got these penalties, but if you drive slowly enough, Hulkenberg, who didn't get to stop under the safety car, will have the ability to pit and finish in tenth place and get us a point." but you have to drive perfectly and you have to drive so slow that you create a 20 second gap. And he did exactly that. No one could get around him at all. And Hulkenberg pitted and he got the point for Haas. And then he sped up so much. This is the bit that I love that nobody noticed. He sped up so much that Verstappen couldn't catch him. So even though he had 20 seconds penalties, he also was the last finisher on the same lap as Verstappen, he was unlapped, so the penalty didn't affect his actual finishing place at all. He finished 12th, and that's the position he got. Or maybe 11th, and then Albon, he flopped with Albon. But yeah. Okay, I th this is the American point of view, and the Americans don't mind cheating at all, do they? They're like, yeah, let's get in there, let's get what every, any advantage we can. But from the British and Canadian point of view, Christina, at what point does that become not cricket? Oh, there are no rules in sports. All's fair in love and war. I like if you want to win, you do what you got to do. Like you're not going to get anything from me in that aspect. Uh, you're from the I land of hockey was... fist fights as well. So, yeah. Oh, yeah. Like, but you know what? Any advantage you could get, it's it's fine. That's part of the sport. If it's not explicitly said you cannot do it in the regulations, mm. go for it and do it. I love regulations. I think they're fabulous. But you read them and you interpret them as they're written. If somebody wrote a poor set of regulations that allow for things like this to occur, for strategies to exploit the gaps in the regulations, then you do that. Don't get me wrong. I, I love the team interplay, Matt, but he is yeah. he was legitimately just lifting in the in that high speed section that makes me go. If anything goes wrong there, no one's got time to react, and you're just going through those slow speed things, just 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 not accelerating. Yeah, well, I mean, if people thought they could go faster, they were free to pass them, weren't they? Oh, uh, do you know what EJ has... Um, oh, EJ, a Danish patron in our patron live chat, has come to the defense of Kevin Magnussen here. And I'm not really attacking Kevin Magnussen because... Um, but he does need some defending today. So you could argue that he has gone to the dark side uh, today. So, yeah, in Monaco, nobody bats an eyelid about people being slowing up. But there's a difference, I think, between pace and go, this is my tire saving pace and then just not accelerating. So this is an argument I've had with the, with the, the racers like Brad and Alex and Kyle in, in the Missed Apex chat. But because they, they've got you know, all this experience in karting and sim racing, they think absolutely nothing of just not accelerating out of a corner. So, you know, so I'll be behind them and, you know, and then I'll hit them. I go, but you didn't accelerate. And they go, well, I didn't have to. I don't have to clear the space in front of you. I'm not obliged to do that. So, I mean, Magnussen was doing a very extreme version of that. And so suddenly, you know, you look you look at the TV, Matt, and you go, oh, why is there seven cars bunched up together at the back of the grid? Imagine if something like that was happening, you know, up at the sharp end. That would have been it, incredible, but it was anyway. Well, didn't we see Perez employ a tactic like that at one point? Up at the sharp end? Oh, in I mean, Abu Dhabi, the, the race yeah. which we dare not speak its name. Uh, sorry, it just it, it just came to mind as an example. Yeah. I forgot it was attached to your favorite race ever. Yeah, no, yeah. So there's, I, I just wonder where that limit is. So can you stop? Like, at, what, at what point is it deemed? Because okay, put it this way: when when a tactic starts to become more recognised, because now if you've got two drivers together and they're willing to work together, you know which teams would do that? Maybe Ocon and Gasly would would do that. Maybe Sonoda and Ricardo. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. But, you know, there, there are certain teams in the midfield where if they're running together, now you kind of go, all right, li let's just literally create a gap. I don't think I've seen it that extreme before, Matt, where they've done that to, to benefit one driver. And in fact, the only near example I can think of is slowing down and creating a gap in the pit lane during a safety car to ensure that your double stat works out. And that is penalised now, doing that. So why, yeah. so why isn't this? 
Um, I think because, again, there's no regulation that you have to drive the car as fast as the car is capable of being driven. I think, the, to answer your question, though, I'm, I'm remembering, I think it was Las Vegas, um, where Alonzo lifted alarmingly early for uh, for a turn. It was coming up to the DRS detection point, and Hamilton was behind him, and Hamilton got on the radio and, and complained about it. And I don't remember if Alonzo was penalized for it, but I think the difference is accelerating out of a corner is a very different thing to suddenly breaking 150 <laughs> meters earlier than you normally do. So in the braking zone, I think you'd have an absolute point uh, beyond your usual lift and coast. People, people aren't gonna be super excited about you being weird in braking zones, but on acceleration, on throttle, that's that's just that's too individual. You have to look at what's ahead of you and judge make your judgments accordingly. And look, it worked out for Haas. They saw the possibility of that strategy. The team did, which I think kudos mm -hmm. to them. They had a car that had genuine pace enough to pull it off, and they had two drivers, both good enough to make it work on the track. And that's that's a big change for them, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, they are good. the two drivers, they are good enough. And they're good enough not in um, their Max Verstappen or their the Lewis Hamilton. They're, they're like the Mighty Ducks. They, they've each got their special thing. Like Magnussen's got the big slap hit. Do you know what I mean? So hang on a bit of a, is that a 90s reference? My references are getting old. But that's, you know, Magnussen's just elbows out attitude towards driving. I think a lot, lot of people were getting upset and like I think people in our chat were saying, oh, he's being a menace. I think he's being a racing driver, but I, I think Haas are on the verge of moving the needle on what teams do in, in Formula One. Because you look at Magnussen's performance today and you go, well, he got punished a bit, but not enough to stop what he was doing. So that, that's, it wasn't a, a deterrent. Now, he, he, he would go and do that again. 100%. Yeah, well, I mean, he didn't get a penalty for all the driving he did after he got the penalties. Now, did he? What he, he got the penalty for, well, you know. Show me where he did dangerous driving. Oh, yeah, when he hit Albon. Uh, so that is our first. Whose oh, fault is it? it? Okay, so we get to play judge and jury. <laughs> Have we got an opinion? Christina Lee Mace, whose fault was it when Magnussen drifted over and smashed Albon into the wall? Oh, I would go with Magnuson in that point. He was he was a, quite far over what a center line would be. And it's Jetta. So at another track, I might have a different opinion of like, yeah, whatever. There's a runoff zone. But he had a couple of instances with Albon, with Sonoda, where, yeah, he just, there was nowhere for the other drivers to go. And it was a game of millimeters kind of a thing where if he had stayed just slightly over, it would have been in the clear. He just misjudged that that little bit where, yes, it's definitely the, on him. It's not actually too dissimilar to Lewis Hamilton in Monza when he cut across, I think it was the second chicane, and he ended up taking the racing line and he hit a McLaren. I can't know. It was Leclerc. I think he hit Leclerc. But in any case, he ended up getting a black and white flag for that. And I, th I think this is quite an interesting one with the rules because he's sort of nearly ahead. So I know you're going to defend Albon whatever, but like, is there not a case to go? Well, he was he was far enough ahead. Surely he he had it. Eh, I think in a place like Jeddah, for me, my judgments at least are they're gonna be different because even if you are farther ahead and you're allowed to you know take the space, just being conscious that there's nowhere for the other person to do, even if it's not for position, just as a courtesy of, hey, I will leave you enough space so you don't go smashing into the wall. Sorry, courtesy. <laughs> That's it. You just told me there are no rules in sport. Everything's on the cards and you want Kevin Magnuson of all people to show courtesy. I mean, to not have somebody crash. Yes, that's where I draw the line. Um, if you want to, if there's room to drive them off the track, I'm all for that. But if there isn't, um, maybe don't do that. I think there's there's a big difference, Matt. We we have a um, a schism in our community between yeah. adhering to the the lane system and kind of and then the you're entitled to this entry, you're entitled to this corner. You've this is your corner. Whereas a lot of us are like, yeah, but you there was a vehicle there, so it, it, it's a tough one. I, I don't think it's as simple as it quite looked. 
Uh, no, actually, it's not. And I will now mostly defend Magnuson. I think uh, from a technical reading of the rules, it would be difficult for it not to have been his fault. He was at, at it was an avoidable collision. However, what has not been talked about yet is the particular design of the track entering that corner where that kind of juts out at you and you have to swing out to get round it. And I bring this up because of all people, Alex Albon, who if anyone should have been, you know, uh, miffed at this contact, it was him. And he's like, honestly, he said, it's pretty much a racing incident because the track really forces you that way. And it was clear he wasn't intentionally trying to drive me into anything. He just drifted a little further, trying to open up that corner a bit more and didn't realize where I was because he probably couldn't see me in his mirrors because they can apparently never see anything in their mirrors at all. And, and so, I, I mean, I'm, I'm tempted to just say, you know, I really kind of blame the track and the track design for this one because it puts the drivers when they're that close together into an almost inevitable conflict. If, you know, if they're trying to race each other. It's a little bit like Imola as well, where you go into that turn one and the track just drifts out to the right. And that's where you got yeah. the Russell Bottas incident, didn't you? And yeah. yeah, so you can kind of argue about where the track was going. But here, I don't, it does feel fairly certain that there was a wall on the other side of Albon, so Albon couldn't do anything. But I, I didn't see what was behind Albon. So from a driver coach point of view, you know, we're always talking about risk reward. You've got Magnussen, coming across the track he's pretty far ahead of you do you have to keep your nose in because i i think the current rules of f1 though favor uh albon so we, we've always seen that penalized but i i think in the olden days olden days racers would have gone well i'm far enough ahead i'm going to take my my racing line and if you want to crash go for good luck you know <laughs> that would that would have been the center way yeah, and, and and I think, you know, I mean, again, you know, we talk about iRacing, but I certainly try to avoid overlapping people that way in tight spaces if I can possibly avoid it. Now, obviously, Album was trying to get round him, so, you know, there there there's that to be considered. But but yeah, I, I think it was just Magnuson not being able to understand where Album was in relationship to him. And also, he had um, he had a driver directly in front of him that I think he was also trying to mm. negotiate with heading into that turn. So that that could have been part of it too. He had because at that point they were all stuck together. They yeah. had people all on all sides of them. So yeah, it was messy. Yeah. So who else was uh, involved with that? And apologies, we're starting at the the back end of the grid. I just feel like this is the most interesting interesting thing that happened. But uh, so in there you had Albon and you had. Sonoda in there, and I think Joe Guan Yu was in there as well. But th this is it between the Visa Cash App drivers. Joe uh, Joe Guan Yu was was sorry, I beg your pardon. Yuki Sonoda was in the mix, fighting everybody in there, bumping wheels, cutting off Bearman, and it just seemed like Ricardo could barely hang on. Christina, so you know that's if you're a Danny Rick fan, you're looking at the two qualifyings and that race and going, what, what's happening? not a good weekend that's for sure and quite frankly i couldn't even really tell you what was going on with him because i did not pay attention to him that much i felt like you could tell right from the get-go of qualifying that he just was not vibing with the car he was not having a good weekend and i kind of just ignored him after that and then you see him Rude. just spin out on his own was it on end. his own was it just on his own yeah it, there was no other car around you can see it from verstappen's on board when he's coming up to lap they're going around turn one and two, I believe it was. Hmm. And Ricardo's rear end just swings out. And then he's facing backwards. It seemingly, maybe he hit a curb kind of funny, but there's not a crazy, crazy drastic curb at that point. It's a relatively soft one. It And he'd been struggling the whole race. It's just a bad time to start to have a slump because the RB seats, the Red Bull seats, everything is quite chaotic. So if you're Danny Rick, you got to pull yourself together a little bit and put out good performances. And that's just not what we got this weekend. As I said earlier, it was nice to see him regain the form he had with McLaren today. Yeah, well, actually, that was going to be my point, which is well, how much danger is he in reputationally and career wise? Like, I'm sure he's made his money out of Formula One and he's definitely he is going to be a pundit on Sky Sports. 
So if anybody thinks that Daniel Ricciardo isn't going to be or doesn't want him to be a pundit on Sky Sports, prepare to be disappointed because we have we have seen this before. We saw it with David Coulthard. go, oh, yeah, no, he's got pundit written all over him. And then Mark Webber is more in the Mark Webber mold. And Jensen Button, that was the most blatant one where I called that from about eight seasons out and went, he is desperate to be on Sky Sports. So Ricardo's going to be OK, but reputationally, like a, you know, the heavyweight boxer comparison I always use, Matt, this is not good for Ricardo. He's already got that, the damaging McLaren thing under his belt. Nobody was really convinced that he was on top of Sonoda last season. And now it looks like Sonoda's stretching his legs. Yeah, well, to me, the big difference here is qualifying. I mean, the race is the race. His performance in the second half of the race can't be attributed fully to him because he had a 41 second pit stop under the safety car which kind of when was that today today oh i missed that missed that totally yeah, no okay almost everybody did I mean, if someone asked why is ricardo in the, in in the in the end of the line and i went and looked and i'm like oh well you know 41 seconds okay but even at the, to be even at the end of the line though everybody else in that line was making moves on each other and it just it looked like rick was was barely able to to hang on so uh, there must have been some other issue at the end and the the telltale is this that losing it for no reason on his own you kind of go that sort of points to you know to something being up yeah well i mean to me that's like i'm ready to burst (laughs) maybe his appendix is getting ready to burst i think it's just like it's a mental thing like you go in for that race you're struggling and you go in and then with a pit stop like that, you know your race is done. Like, I'm finished. I might as well park this car because it's not that fast and I'm not catching all those people and I'm certainly not passing them at this track with this car. And, you know, like, yeah, your mind wanders. The tires wear out. Because, like, like how can you... When you know... This is cyclist used to do this. Oh, he's got when cycling you, in. Everyone drink cycling. Sorry, but but you would. Like, if you got dropped from the main pack and you were miles behind... At a certain point, you ask yourself, what is the point in finishing this race? And I, I just wonder if maybe once that pit stop happened, if maybe that's right. Like his brain just kind of went there. Yeah. No. And I, I, yeah, I've seen that in, in races. And by the way, I make no apology for comparing my experiences on iRacing or karting to Formula One. Right. Just it's a feature. It's happening. So when you have all that build up, we used to do two weekly races. We used to do the swarm two weekly races on a Wednesday and I build up to it and I'm practicing and practicing for that lap. If if you make, get contact on lap one and then you've, you're staring down the barrel of 25 laps of just, you know, you're not going to catch anyone. It is very demoralizing. But then again, it's not my job that I get paid millions to do. The last one in that pack and that was kind of disappointing is Stake F1. Now, me and Christina were very, were very fan uh, curious with steak. I feel like after the livery launches, we were both nudging over to, okay, I want to wanna give these guys a, a fair shake of the stick. But ooh, what a horrible weekend. It's, it's never good when you have the same mistake happen twice. And even if it's not the exact same mistake, it is close enough that it definitely has you raising your eyebrows to what's going on there. And I mean, part of their misfortunes were just Joe having the unho- the horribly timed crash oh, right at the end of FP3. Worst case scenario. They rushed, rushed as like as hard as they possibly could, and they just missed that checkered flag by seconds. And then he had the horrible pit stop. So it was a weekend just filled with misfortunes that bad timing after bad timing. And it really does make it hard to feel optimistic <laughs> when you no. see just that kind of a slump it's it's not encouraging at all no but which so for joe Guan Yu to just drop it like that and stick it in the wall that's not something that he's he's generally done so i do class him as a, a pay driver i think he's a buy-in driver i know people argue with me but he growing up the lad had his own go-kart track so they just had a go-kart track that was for him yeah so and i think i think they are incredibly wealthy so i think it's as close to a, a pay driver as you can get without being one but he generally keeps himself out of, the, out of trouble and doesn't isn't annoying and seems to be broadly on Bottas's pace. So a little bit out of character for that that fairly innocuous crash that then cost them the qualifying. But it, it sort of hang on, I wish there was a, a race driver here because as he was sliding backwards into the barrier, my instinct was can't he just accelerate forwards to try and slow down? Do you reckon that would work? 
There's no race drivers here. Just drop a gear, first gear, rev it up in the I movies. Mean, I would do that in snow and ice, but like exactly. that's usually when I'm in an empty parking lot just for for the fun of it. Um, Hooligan. No, it's it's Canada. There's nothing else to do. No, that's true. Throw stuff at geese. Yeah, like, exactly. ah, ah, fight me, bro. <laughs> Canadian Greece are mean. Uh, geese are mean. So, so not only that, but then obviously they're scrambling then to get it ready for qualifying. And then, so in Q1, they're working on it the entire time in Q1. They're, they're attaching duct tape to things, and but they do get him out. But then right. he, he dawdles around on the outlap and no one seemed to say to him, mate, hurry up. And then he just never got his lap in. So uh, it, that's like a penalty shootout for the engineers, desperately getting him out on track. And then he didn't even get a lap in. And you just go, oh, all that work, I'm done. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm just going to bring up the possibility here because everybody else was out and slowing down for their last laps. He got out, it was under two minutes left. He was well off of a standard outlap oh, right. amount yeah. of time. Well, how how, how long had, is a standard outlap then? Um, two, two and a half minutes. Oh, maybe. that's worth that. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So then you don't want to overheat your tires or take too much out of them. Well, no, you you might as well because you might gain a position or two if you have a good light. You might as well try and make the checkers, but he's also going to run into everybody backing up to give themselves space for their last runs to make Q2. And I suspect that that traffic it at the end of it all was was why he couldn't really get round and uh have a proper go at it. So Paddy's saying I think his rear axle locked up. And so you remember at the beginning of the hybrid era, you'd get loads of just weird braking things where the engine braking at the back would do something to the rear wheels. I'm not sure it was that. I, I think racing drivers have it drummed into them that you hold the brakes in that situation. So I think that's the reason why it looked like the wheels weren't turning. So he, he's in a spin and his instinct is hold the brakes. Less can go wrong if I if I just hold the brakes. But then there was a pit stop but, uh, later on in the, in the race where yeah. Joe was... Uh, had a long stop yeah. and I don't know if you noticed there was like O-rings bouncing along like they, they were I don't know what they were doing but they had like spare parts bouncing along and I don't know if the wheel nuts have got a washer on them but I saw something the size of an F1 wheel nut in, that looked very much like a washer and and they seemed to put the wheel on without it now I know <laughs> as, en as engineers and mechanics you tend to say washers are for wimps but again it just spoke of maybe something operationally not quite clicking. Um, but anyway, I think we can I think we can move slightly up the grid. Okay, so uh, let's uh, two teams that have done well, and then I think into the Hamilton versus the McLarens. It's really hard to talk about Red Bull at the moment. Like it's so difficult to go, what interesting content is there around Red Bull that doesn't involve subterfuge? That isn't game of Red Bull. I so this Matt is not my opportunity to go right. Here is my here's my dossier of what I think is going on in the civil war at Red Bull. I'm more than happy yeah. midweek to come and have a chat about it because I'm expecting some more information to come out tomorrow. But the on track stuff, it's really difficult to talk about. All you can say, Max Verstappen, lap one, bullied his way into the leads. And then disappeared. Well done. And then led. Uh, yeah. We, you know, you, you were you were wrong. But I'm first. You are first, but you were wrong. Oh. Because we have a lovely battle at the start with Ferrari and Leclerc and Perez. True. And an observation from me, which is this is the second race in a row where both Red Bulls have gotten amazing launches, much to the detriment of uh, Leclerc, who has been on the front row and generally not been able to keep up with him. So I think that's an issue maybe for Ferrari to try and figure out why Red Bull are so good at the starts oh, now. Oh, good. Another thing that Red Bull are absolutely brilliant at. <laughs> they, honestly, though, they, they don't have any weaknesses. So I've seen dominant cars before, and then when you've had dominant cars like the, the 2014 Mercedes, there was loads of stuff that went wrong. They had reliability issues. They had uh, some tactical... You know, they had that do nothing policy that then messed them up when they had to fight against Vettel. Uh, yeah, in the Ferrari. But where's the weakness? There's no weaknesses at Red Bull. Go on, ask me which gearbox Perez is on right now. Which gearbox is Perez on right now? Number two. And that's high, I assume, too. 
Okay. Yeah. You generally don't want to have a new gearbox every race. How that's, many, Christina? That's going to run you out. That you're limited to three or four. I think. I think for the season. Yeah, squeaks meow twice. So, <laughs> I think he thinks it's two. Well, he's Wait, got do two. we have a new poke now? Yeah. They took it down, then they took it up. But yeah, he's already gone through one. But hey, Max Verstappen didn't get fastest lap this week. So you know what? Uh, he chink. should probably think about retiring, schlumping away into a corner to sit in shame. He lost a whole point that was up for grabs. Like, what's going on with him? The how can, how can, that's going to keep him up at night. So that's going to distract him from all his sim racing. I, why what was he was doing before he went to the race? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, apparently, yeah, 4 a.m. He was still doing eye racing and, and streaming yeah. that. And then still manages to just tip up and, you know, dominate the F1 championship. So why was Perez closer? Perez seemed a lot happier with the car. Was Max just on cruise control? Because if I, I think, you know, Red Bull are causing enough damage to F1 at the moment without Verstappen being 50 seconds up the road. You could just, someone could have a word in his ear and go, hey, you know, once you're 10 seconds up the road, that'll do. Perez is not going to come charging after you anyway. Or do you think that gap did genuinely close? Someone guess. Well, here's the thing. Like, you know how people will do look at uh, FP2 times and do long run analysis and just sort of give you a general pace marker for where they think all the teams are. And everybody does it. Everybody comes up with different numbers. But in general, what I saw was two to three tenths. Everybody's two to three tenths back of Red Bull. I think it was a bit more in the race because I think race conditions like traveling and traffic can sort of magnify those. But but I'm not sure how much farther up the road they could have been if Red Bull just said, yeah, just bury it. Use all the gas up. Don't worry about the tires. Just go, 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 go. I, I think it is genuinely closer. But I think the thing that's made it different this season is that Perez is close in the race now, much closer to Verstappen than he was last season. Like once Verstappen, once they got like their first big updates, Verstappen was just gone from everybody. And it was 13 seconds to Perez. It was 18 seconds to Leclerc. So he had two cars inside a pit stop. He did, I think, take his time with the hard tires. When Norris was at the head of the restart, I'm like, wow, it's taken him a while to get around Norris. But then it occurred to me, well, you know, th these tires have to last a long time. And you know eventually Norris is pinning anyway. And and so just take your time, bring them in gently, and then then when they're fully up to temperature, you can just, you know, go buy him like he's, you he's know, the driving still. grandma's jalopy or something. If I have to confess, there was just a slight glimmer of hope. So obviously the there was only two cars that didn't pit. And my immediate instinct was, oh, uh, in that front battle. So you had Norris and and Hamilton. Who didn't pit? Also, Joe didn't pit. Who else then? Yeah, uh, Joe Hulk and uh, Joe and Hulk and Hulk with the other two. Okay, so in, instinctively, you go that that doesn't look like the right call. They've been forced into doing that. They are they're now on a, a worn, you know, tire. Six laps on heavy fuel on the on a less durable tire. Uh, the the hards are going to come in and, and swamp them. But there was that moment of hope, and you go, well, well, what if what if is, this is the best tactic? And actually, they're not having to worry about preserving their tires, and then. Verstappen cruelly didn't immediately overtake Lando Norris, which just gave us a few laps going, hang on a minute, hang on. But so why was that such a bad, a bad way to have been forced to go in the end, Matt? Um, I was just looking to make sure that they were the only four who didn't pit. Um, it was bad because of the pit stop last time, ultimately. So Norris definitely was just, let's try something different. I think Norris was was taking the low probability, high reward strategy. At, at the time, they said, oh, well, you know, he was behind Piastri. Maybe McLaren was worried about double stacking or just a busy pit lane. And they're like, hey, look, you know, these medium tires will go 40-ish laps. If we keep you out there, you're going to be in front or near the front. And if we get another safety car, then you're going to win the big lottery ticket strategy wise because you'll have gained four you're going to gain more places by that than you'll be able to by overtaking people because the delta to overtake people here is so high with a strong drs and so i think i think for norris it was definitely just a roll of the dice he sort of he was behind his teammate 
and uh, it would get him ahead of his teammate and it could really pay off big uh, points wise for the team. So, eh, why not do it? Why not see what happens? Yeah. And, and honestly, and Ham- but Hamilton sounded less happy. He sounded uh, about as happy as Squeaks McGee because like, he never wants to be left out on the old tyres. Like, he's always unhappy with it. Yet, you know, Mercedes, they just, they, they're not aggressive. So if you were going to say, right, one team's going to leave a driver out, you would have put Mercedes on that list straight away, and he immediately wasn't happy. Well, yeah. I mean, what driver wants to be on slower, older tyres? <laughs> It's, I think it's just kind of the role of Mercedes this year to kind of be a disappointment. Oh. I, <laughs> look, yeah. they, they are, they lack confidence in themselves and they have for a number of years. I'm not going to think that they're going to do a great job if they themselves are just saying, oh, well, it's the best that it's going to be. It is what it is. Like we're still trying to fix. They went ahead and they have a new concept of car this year. Oh my God. Uh, has your that cat is... your cat has tripped something on your computer that is yeah, now he did. so it's the accessibility thing so if you just type uh... what you say your computer is going to tell us what it is it looks like you've <laughs> solved it now um, it. so i think look, we can uh... talk about mercedes being a genuine disappointment christina i yeah. they, they obviously there's that slack of well it's a brand new thing and i think they were way more confident than it's now turned out over these two races and i think they look lost they look disappointed and it's horrible it is and the the part that's frustrating for me is that they spent so much time trying to fix something that just clearly wasn't working in the last two years so they've just dug themselves into a hole at this point that they're really struggling to get out of and i mean a bad day for mercedes isn't necessarily a bad day overall they're still up there as far as teams go which is baffling to me but it's even more disappointing when you watch somebody like lewis hamilton who you know can put together fabulous laps can drag bad cars to the absolute limit of what is possible and how bad does a car have to be for lewis hamilton not to be able to make it somewhat performative like it's (sighs) incredibly disappointing okay but I'm not even feeling that positive. So obviously Lewis Hamilton fan here. I am now, I, I dread Q3. And I have to start asking really like what what is going on? So we know that he favours a race setup. That's fine. I get that. So he doesn't mind slotting in behind his teammate. But he hasn't been slotting in behind his teammate when it's gone wrong. It's really gone wrong. And so now I go into Q3 last couple of seasons going, oh, I hope Hamilton can like nick P6 or maybe a top five. If, if we're dreaming, top five. There's not been a single Q3 where I've thought, oh, we might get on the front row or oh, he's going to you know, even get in the top three. And Russell has been, has just been more on it in the build up to races. So the thing that I want to talk about now, more than anything, is the bouncing. at Mercedes because he was complaining about this. And this is going to bring me in 10 or 20 short minutes to the Williams hypothesis. Okay, maybe not 10 or 20 minutes, but hear me out. (laughs) The thing with the balancing is it causes the aerodynamic center of pressure to migrate unpredictably. And what Hamilton was complaining about was this rear instability it's plagued them the last three years it's the one thing they haven't solved the car he says feels better but at this track and especially i think at these speeds faster you go the more you're likely to have this problem he's getting instability in the rear now russell spent a long time driving for williams who we know through Albon had a very unpredictable rear end and had to be driven in a specific way. I think that the current feeling of the car, it's unstable on entry, is something Russell has actually had more practice with. And so he's more comfortable with the car. I think mainly what we're seeing here is a confidence difference because Russell has had simply more practice with the car like this. Didn't we have that at points of the last season when the car was performing, Hamilton looked better, and when yeah. when it was not so much, then then Russell was well. We uh, that's not completely uncommon. So we did see it with Ricardo when he moved to Red Bull from Toro Rosso, 
And because he was used to a car that was not really responsive, he was doing better than Vettel, who just could not abide the car whose rear end was just not doing what he wanted. I was going to bring up Weber and those tires. Remember when they had the squishy tires and it ruined the Red Bull blown diffuser? And suddenly Weber was just beating Vettel until Red Bull yeah. talked them into changing the tires back. Yeah, it's the yeah. same thing. Yeah, so so there could there could be that, but it also could be, and I'm going to get email, Matt at mistapex.net emails. Please send me emails. I'm lonely. I'm just, the more qualifying performances that go by where he's just nowhere near, you know, getting there and, and we're relieved that he gets into Q3, the more you go, the peak could have come and gone when it comes to one lap pace. I'm not saying he's not smart, not saying he can't manage a race brilliantly and, and, and think his way through a Grand Prix, but maybe you don't get quicker forever in your one lap pace maybe that starts to go like most most athletes the peak is late 20s and hamilton's late 30s so i i would like to see a qualifying performance could somebody just convince hamilton to not set up for the race just one time because that's not working anyway someone convince lewis hamilton to set up for a one lapper just so that we can just see yeah go to australia and go and stick it on the front row i don't care if you disappear down the grid 2013 style yeah, just stick it on the front row. So that's, you know, in the fan space, I'm sad. <laughs> yeah, fair and I, enough. I want to be proved wrong. That's the thing. Well, I also have to wonder if a couple of years ago, back during the first era of year of this era of regulations, we knew that Hamilton was being a lot more experimental with the setups. And yeah. He was trying a lot wider variety of things. So do we give him the benefit of the doubt maybe that that's what he's doing again now? Completely new maybe. car, completely new concept. And he's using these first couple of rounds at least to just try things and be more experimental than maybe Russell is. Are you which, telling me not to panic in the uh, first couple of races? What you're describing did happen in 2022, though. Yes. He, he took it upon himself to do a lot of testing. He, they ran him heavy with extra test equipment at the, the beginning. But there's no indication that that's what's happening this time. So they haven't like said... Oh, Lewis is trying new things to help us solve our problems. Be the Lulu. Sometimes it's the <laughs> okay. Lulu. Wow. Stick that on a T-shirt, Matt. <laughs> well, uh, one of the things that I, I did today was I sort of trawled through the radio messages. And there was one to Lewis from his engineers. Basically, he was like, where are we losing time in the race? To, to Aston and to the McLaren. And they're basically like, turn four through turn ten. But you're yeah. basically, you're flat with Russell. You and Russell are going the same pace in this race. But our car itself cannot keep up in this one section. And that's where all the time loss is. Because he was complaining about being slow. And they're like, yeah, we know. We're looking at the GPS. It's telling us the same story here. Again, they're trying to fix this problem by stacking more downforce on the rear by putting a bigger wing on, but it's draggier. It's draggier than the kinds of downforce the other cars have. So it puts them at a real disadvantage on these very high speed circuits. I'm not saying they're not going to be able to fix it by the end of the season. If anyone can, Mercedes can, optimizing, that's what they do as engineers. But right now the problem they have is they have to solve this and they haven't yet. And it's putting them at a disadvantage, especially at tracks like this. Okay, but one of our fine patrons who supports us at patreon.com forward slash Mr.Apex, uh, Matteo, is saying it's depressing to see Lando getting away from Hamilton in those high-speed corners at the end of the race. Well, not depressing if you're a McLaren or Lando Norris fan. But what's weird, Matt, is seeing yeah. Mercedes being so schooled on downforce. Because I know they had the engine advantage, but it was always downforce points massive amounts of of downforce points yeah they were able to power through them before maybe and and they can't do that now but it was just so odd that they were the williams style rocket ship on the straights and it was the mclarens that were dancing through the snakes yeah uh, but again that's just down to sort of mclaren having a bet better overall package and mercedes trying to slap a band-aid on this problem where it's really going to cost them a lot of lap time. Um, uh, over the course of a season, uh, it's, it's too soon to know where this is mm -hmm. going to wind up. But the concern for me is that they never saw porpoising, they never saw bouncing as a problem with their tools. They changed their whole design, they got a new rear end, but the bouncing is still there. They weren't the only teams that had it. Red, Red Bull was complaining about it in the first practices, but you notice they weren't complaining about it in the race. 
Yeah, it does. So yeah. I still worry that maybe they don't have a handle on exactly why this is happening to them. Okay, some positives then for before we leave McLaren. You have to say, well, George Russell pretty much delivered and maximized in qualifying. And then yep. he, he had the adva- the advantage of the plan A. So that was the plan A, wasn't it? Is, is was to go yeah. uh, softs, hard. Uh, sorry, what they start on? Mediums? Medium hard. Yeah, medium, yeah. medium hard, a little bit early, but then... The only the, what I noticed, Matt, was a lot of the drivers were really over managing, and then I think there came a point in the race where they went, "Oh, these hards, this is like Sochi 2012 or whatever. Yeah, these hards aren't much. going off. Uh, we can just push." So Russell was like maintaining 34 and a half second laps, and at one point I went, "Oh, oh, he's really struggling to keep up with Hamilton. Hamilton's got him on race pace." But as soon as Russell needed to, they, him and Alonso, sort of were in the 32s. And they were going for it. So you have to say massively solid performance by by Russell simply on executing the basics, qualifying, race pace. So that's good. And if you wanted to praise Hamilton, which I do, then also the defence against Piastri was wonderful to watch. Yeah, well, that was like some of the most exciting scenes of the race. Piastri trying to get by him. And really the Aston and the McLaren were similar. So Russell might have had more pace in the car, but he was stuck at Alonso's pace because Alonso was fast in that turn four through turn 10, and there was nothing he could do about it. Yeah, I, 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 enjoy, I, enjoyed, watching the, yeah, I enjoyed watching the Piastri battle just because it, it was clear that there was a difference in the driver's skill at that point. Sorry, Piastri yeah. fans, but Hamilton, that was a much better defense than Piastri's attack. And Piastri was basically doing the same thing lap after lap except with less of a tire advantage. And then it just, you know, and the one great chance he had, he, he uh, you know, he stuffed it on the brakes and, and went off into turn. Yeah. And, and, and Lewis only had to hit him once to keep him behind. Now, that's a funny one, because years ago, I'd have looked at that. Like, he, d- he did that to Rosberg a couple of times. He did it in the Canadian Grand Prix, I think, in 2015. And he go, that's rude, and I don't like that. But that's completely mandated by the rules at the moment. So because Piastri wasn't alongside him, Apparently, he can just drive him off the road, and and no one bats an eyelid. Like there was, an, if that had happened five years ago, three four years ago, people would be going, "Why didn't Hamilton get a penalty?" But now, no one bats an eyelid because we're so used to that. Well, I don't know why. Why did he not get a penalty? Because you're allowed. Mm. Because it is sanctioned in the rules. Because because he had the apex, and Piastri basically had no business being there. Therefore, Hamilton could just claim the outside and push him off. Um, but yeah, so yeah, definitely, you know, a, a big positive for for Hamilton optically but actually tactically he gained absolutely zero from holding Piastri off he was on completely the different different tactics and it was never going to benefit him to hold Piastri up very true but it, was it not going to help Russell a I little know. bit I don't know holding I, was up trying everyone to do that maths. I was trying to do that maths yeah I'm not sure with 10 seconds so it might have helped held the Piastri charge off uh, but look uh, what what's the general running order then, uh, Christina? How do you rate the the top top three or four now that we've seen a couple of races? Ooh, like top three, four drivers? No, four cars. I think I like seeing the potential of the cars. Yeah. Well, we know the Red Bull is the number one car. Well done. Solid start to this rankings. Like, I can count to one, y'all. Good for me. Next <laughs> up, next up, the Ferrari car. We can just put that there. And then, besides that, I. It doesn't really feel like we have a front, mid, and back of the grid. It really does feel this year like we have a front of the grid and then a back of the grid. And that feels very strange. It's I appreciate split, the fact it? that the back of the grid is fighting amongst themselves. I appreciate that they are all seemingly on the same pace-ish, at least, or competitive with each other. I appreciate that. But for the front, next three cars are pretty obvious. It's... I feel like the McLaren, Aston, and Mercedes, they're just going to swap positions of which one's better depending on which track yeah. they suit better. Yep. It's On average, they're incredibly close. And who's going to come out on top is going to depend on A, strategy, and B, the number of well-suited tracks that we end up at. How many of them thought ahead and prioritized you know, getting the most out of straight line speed versus high speed corners? Just do you, Do they do that? Do they calculate X number of turns, X number of straights? What do we optimize for? They must. Yeah. And then you make the calculated decision. Whoever made the most calculated decision 
decision for how to optimize their car is probably going to come out on top out of those three. So, but operationally, you just go, right, okay, Mercedes doing poorly and McLaren yeah. doing really well are about even. That's that's how I'm looking at it at the moment. And that's what's happening. Like Mercedes are leaving so much on the table. McLaren are just doing fantastically. And they are, well, I'd say McLaren actually have the, have the edge at the moment. And Ferrari are clear. So Ferrari are clear in that, that second place at the moment. Um, but Aston Martin made a little stake uh, to that claim today as well. Like, uh, Fernando Alonso finished up in P4. At, again, solid. P4, P5? P5, Five, yeah, yeah, P5. But this is a track with the low wear, I think, that is going to suit Mercedes and Aston Martin more compared to uh, compared to Mercedes, for sure. What's uh, what's the Australian Grand Prix for wear? That's a one-stopper as well, isn't it? I think it's a one-stopper. I think it is, but it may not be as kind to the tyres that you one-stop. Oh, I see. So they might have you sort of clinging on for a bit. But here's a bit of a stat for you. right? We're talking, Christina, you said there's a front of the grid and then there's a back of the grid. There's no midfield. You are absolutely correct, right? So hot Red Bull, unsurprisingly, up there with 87. Then Ferrari, 49. Um, McLaren ahead, actually 28. Mercedes only on, on 26. Aston Martin in there with 13 points. So that's your top five. Guess how many points P6 has got? Two. One. One? So, yeah. One. So Haas, with that point today, has just risen up to P6 in the championship. And you've got Williams, Sauber, uh, yeah, Sauber, uh, Visa Cash App and Alpine all on zero points. Like you have absolutely nailed that the 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 pack is split in half. That's crazy. That's crazy. I thought the cost cap was meant to stop that kind of thing, Matt. Well, I think it has though, because because it's also meant to just bring the whole field spread closer, and and it is getting closer. I mean, you had granted Magnuson had a lot to do with it, but you had that whole pack behind Magnuson just fighting with each other and at least with the DRS at this track able to keep up and and really have a proper fight with each other which I'm glad they did because it made the race a lot more exciting to watch but uh, again the issue here is Ferrari have put it together they're behind Red Bull but they put it together yeah, they have, yeah. Red Bull has put it together and they've had it together for a while so that's not a surprise and then both Mercedes and McLaren Neither one of them quite got it together for the start of the season. Aston, I think, uh, got very lucky at this race. They were fast exactly where they needed to be. I don't think they had as much race pace as Mercedes did. No, I think Alonso knew that as well. Yeah. Yeah, was... yeah no, we're agreeing. But he had the pace in the right place to keep the Mercedes from being able to pass him. And that if Mercedes solves that problem, I think you're going to see oh, Aston wow. in the same kind of bubble they were in last year sort oh. of like slower than everybody else but faster than the rest of the midfield i really want to know how good alonso is i just i really want him up against that just any kind of who was he up against he was against ocon he looked in race pace matt he did look pretty good if you want to rate ocon highly then he looked good against ocon but at the moment we're seeing him up against stroll and we've really got no idea i would love yeah. to see two drivers in that like stick gasly in there with him and, and and just see see what's there because my instinct is that he's wringing the neck of that Aston Martin and that he's pulling miracles off every you know week in week out. That's my instinct. But that's 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 the Alonso propaganda machine. Oh, I've work, fallen though. for it, haven't I? I've fallen yeah. for it. Oh, with yeah. him with him going. Oh, I'm wringing it. Oh, I'm, I'm 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 bursting with sweat. My arms are falling off, but I'm doing it somehow. Yeah, I mean, yeah. and don't get me wrong. He is a great driver, and he's oftentimes by far the most entertaining thing on track, especially when he gets irritable on the radio. So, so I, I'm not, and, and you know, his beef with Ocon aside, the two of them, he's <laughs> won championships. He's a great driver. He's clearly much faster than Stroll. The interesting thing is if you got someone of that quality level in the Aston, where would they be in relationship? This is the same with the Verstappen Perez thing. This year, Perez is a lot closer. Last year he wasn't. So, eh. I don't know, but overall, I'm not as convinced by the Aston as a car as I am by the McLaren and the Mercedes, well, and I'll stick with that. Okay, I think they got lucky with the tyre wear, and that, that probably suited them as well, and it might be track-specific, but it was genuine this weekend. They were up there. They were up there in you know through FP2, and I was a little bit cynical because you know the Armco sponsor is associated with the track, 
and especially yeah. with certain rumors coming out that <laughs> at this track maybe Alonso got some favorable treatment. So when they popped up in FP2, I thought that was a bit of a, a glory run for their sponsor. But but you can't deny that you know they had top running pace. You know they were likely the third fastest. Well, they were the third best performing. Where did no? Where did Piastri finish fourth? Piastri yeah, finished yeah, fourth. Yeah. Okay, well, I don't know. You can't deny to me, considering how low my expectations were for Aston Martin after round one. That's a good. That's a good result. So they got something to build on. Yeah, they had a low bar coming into it based on the last half of the twenty three season. All right. Well, that brings us towards the back straight of our Saudi Arabia Grand Prix race review. And unlike F1 Academy, we are going to stop when the checkered flag drops. A little bit of an unfortunate incident in the F1 Academy, Christina. Definitely unfortunate. It's especially when you consider that there's so many procedures in place to make sure that you can't avoid seeing the red flag. But you know what? I was just happy to see those ladies on track. It brought me joy. It made me smile. I cried a little. Was this the season opener? Yes, ah, it was. Okay. And then they're in Miami next. And it, was so, it two races per round? Two races per round, yes. Ah, okay. oh, well, they're in Miami. So they're we're gonna... in Miami next, yes. So they're, they're part, as part of the support series. So I don't know if we're going to mention this. I'll mention this as a, a teaser because the plans have come together very recently. But I think there's a chance the three of us could be watching that F1 Academy together in person because we are planning to get out to Miami. I have a, a work reason to be out in that part of the world at that time. And so I'm combining that with going to the Miami Grand Prix and we are hoping to do some Missed Apex events around it. One thing I would like to do is have Missed Apex listeners join me at the conference center that I'm lining up and watch a, a classic Grand Prix and then we'll, uh, we'll assign blame. To, to, I'll pick one that I can't remember because uh, you know, which is easy because uh, I'm getting old now. My memory's fading, uh, and then we'll do some content around that. So maybe like a a short classic race review, and of uh, you know, have, we'll have a beer or a whiskey. What's the traditional drink of Miami? Tequila. Probably some giant neon colored thing with umbrellas. Brilliant, excellent. Uh, so, um, what I would like is just a bit of feedback. If you're going to Miami and you think you might be interested in a uh, after first practice, second practice meet up. Maybe you could just email me and just with the subject line Miami and mm, maybe something like that. Uh, so go spanners at mistapex.net. And I'm just trying to gather to see how much interest there is in, in us doing some kind of event during the races. And we'll do things like sprint reviews and we'll do a race review while we're out there as well. Uh, what brought me onto this? Oh, yes. Yeah, so it was Dorian Pin. <laughs> That's not how you pronounce her name. It's French, isn't it? Pin Pan. 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 But it's yeah. Pin, isn't it? Dorian Pin. Uh, she missed the checkered flag and went round and did another lap. So she won, missed the checkered flag. Her whole team was celebrating. <laughs> and then she went round, took the checkered flag again, and they had to throw red flags. So she has been deducted 20 seconds and, uh, and has given up that win. Uh, but back to the Formula One. This is the part of the show where we give out our awards. So the first award, now I'm going to do it the right way around. We're going to do the negative one first so we can end on a high. Oh no, you missed the apex. All right. So we'll go to you. Christina Lee Mace. You are you're on TikTok mainly. We'll have a link to your yes. TikToks. You're on Twitter, underfollowed criminally on t Twitter. A pathetic thousand followers on Twitter. 1.1. Oh, Thank you very there much. There we go. Sorry. Uh, go and follow Christina there and Instagram. Yeah. Yeah. I do stuff there. It's mainly, it's only going to be cat pictures, so don't bother with that. So go and follow Christina by clicking all the stuff below. Who missed the apex for you? Oh, boy, oh, boy. Who missed the apex? I, I would have to give it, I'm going to give it to Ricardo. It, he should be better than he is. Him struggling towards the back of the grid and not catching up to that pack is not a good look. Yeah. He so I should have been able to catch up to them. Didn't know about the bad luck of the pit lane, but it didn't look good after that. So let, let's wait out and see if there's some some reason. But in a, it, the stakes couldn't be higher, could they? And that's the problem because I'm looking at that Red Bull situation and you know we'll, we'll talk about it maybe later in the week. But I, there might be a seat available really, really, really soon. You never know. You just don't know. 
Um, so, yeah, Ricardo, for you, Matt, two rumpets at MattPT55 on Twitter. You can follow him on Facebook, but it is literally all he posts is pictures of trumpets. So if you want to see pictures of trumpets, then go and follow him, uh, Matt Trumpets. It is Matt Trumpets, isn't it? Because I set that account up for you. Yeah, yeah, it, it <laughs> yeah. is. It mm. is. Uh, um, who yeah. missed the apex for you? Oh, big announcement coming up, but not now. On midweek. Not now. Personal Look for some interesting news for me later in the week. And that's why you should follow us on Twitter, because you, should, you get personal announcements. Like me and Simon and Dan have recorded our pilot episode of Final Written Warning, where we share your misadventures at work. And I asked for people to share stories with me. And some of you DM'd me crimes. So I'm not sure if you should do that, but we read them out anyway. Anyway, sorry, Matt. Good plan. <laughs> Who missed the apex for you? Well, uh, to me, there, there can only be one winner this weekend. And that has to be Lance Stroll's race engineer going, can you bring it home after oh, he stuffed it into the wall? That was so funny. Yeah, because Lance Stroll does his talking in the wall. Yeah, can you bring, I hit the wall. Can you bring it home? No, I'm in the blimmin' wall, he said. Yeah, but that's unfortunate <laughs> because they don't know. They, they, they don't know that, um, that he's actually stuck it in the wall. I think the first thing he said was, I'm okay. So it's not like it was a really callous race engineer going, okay, but how about the car? It was just so funny, though, wasn't it? Yeah. You always feel like, in honesty, the engineers probably assume most of the time the driver's going to be okay. So they're like, how long is it before I can ask if the car's okay? <laughs> how long is it? Uh, okay, who missed the apex for me? I can't believe I've been left this one, but Alpine as well. So, you know, not only... Should we just do a permanent one? Like, they get a guest slot in it every... But then when they didn't even get Al uh, Gasly, they got barely off the grid and then pulled in, you go... Do you know what? Just bring Ocon in as well. Yeah. But actually, where did Ocon finish? Like 14th? 13th. 13th, 14th. Yeah. But he's there scrapping with Visa Cash App and Haas. That's not where they want to be, Matt. Not where they want to be at all. No, no. Well, I mean, uh, overweight, underpowered is never a great combination on a high-speed course. And Stop uh, well, looking at me. There you go. <laughs> Fair enough. Okay, brilliant. And now that means we get to end on a positive. It's the thing of the weekend. Super duper. Lots of positive things, I think. But let's start with you again, Christina. Who got your thing of the weekend? There's only one right answer to this. <laughs> and if any of you guys say anything other than Ollie Behrman, we can't all say I it. will fly over to your homes and meet you for the first time in nothing but rage and anger. Right. Because it's Ollie Behrman. It was his day. Nothing else mattered. He and his dad were so happy. Whatever. Nothing else matters. Just Ollie, Ma oh, just Ollie Behrman. Oh, I think it was all made a bit much of. I think it was over the top. I think it was over the top. They gave Sometimes it that's okay. They Sometimes you just have to give in to the good feeling spanners. Get right. I had the good feeling. For me, it's as local as you can get. You know, uh, I see any warrior up in Chelmsford. Doesn't really sound like an Essex lad, to be fair. Uh, but he's got that international accent that a lot of drivers have got. Uh, but... I, I feel like the screaming commentary as he crossed the line in seventh, I just don't feel like that was warranted. He was given a babysitting job, yeah, and a ease you in job, and he did it adequately and learned loads of things but along the way and and tried really hard. But you can't say like he he blew he blew open the world of F1. He just did well and with the limited targets he was set and i feel like i'm the only person who is saying this like no one else is being anything but this is the most incredible thing i've ever seen but i'm like it's, it's, it's pretty good it was impressive in a lot of ways christina the looks caveat like she's gonna that kill I would me. have for anyone watching this and being is excited i mean look i was very excited to see bearman it was yeah me a too great story he did really well lots of people would have done much much worse than him Definitely. especially with the notice and the lack of practice that said the circuit itself is a low degradation circuit yeah so the issue for all the rookies generally is yeah, looking after them tires on the abrasive yeah, tracks. Yeah, yeah. So we've not seen him in that. We, we saw Nick DeVries show up and do a really great job and get a drive and then absolutely stuff it when he had to be a full-time race driver. So that would be my cautionary aspect to Behrman. But also, but when, when, Lawson, today, when Lawson came in, 
similarly, no experience. He wasn't given a, hey, don't just stick it in the wall brief. He was like, get at it. And he got at it. Yeah. So I'm just saying, Behrman didn't have that same opportunity to do it because they definitely gave him a, don't smash up Carlos Sainz's car brief. Yeah, uh, they 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 did, and and Lawson, another one who did well. So we have some exciting rookies waiting in the wings, but you have to test them over more than just a single day and a single car to really know what they're made of. Oh, that yeah. would be that would be the only other side of the. It was Ollie Berriman's day. <laughs> but I, was, I I have a different thing of the week. No, no, hang on. I'm just saying. I just wanted to. I, I didn't have the Slack chat open, and I was like. Because Christina was like giving me daggers. I went, how much abuse am I getting in the live chat? Uh, ben says, Spanners hate joy. <laughs> and that's the, first, <laughs> that's the first thing I've seen. And Wes says Spanners doesn't like bears. That's that's true. Uh, bears, are, bears are dangerous. So I understand. I'm just giving a bit of balance to the unbridled, you know, thing. I would love to see him give him, given a chance. And like the, with the brief, go get him, knock him out, kid. But he did everything I think that was asked of him. It, it would have been silly for him to exceed that brief. Matt, thing of the weekend. Thing of the weekend has to be Lando Norris' start. <laughs> well, I mean, he rescued it, didn't he? He saved it. Good save, I reckon that. Yeah. Brilliant. We have yet again the inevitable controversy of somehow this car was moving and yet it didn't jump the start. And I just, I love this every time it happens. But I think the president is, is fine, isn't it? Like we've had it with Vettel and, and Bottas. As, as long as you don't go out of the box, you can take a second jab. Yeah, well, he was out of the, I mean, he was over that line. It I did think, look right? like he was over the line to me. Yeah, yeah. But then, but, uh, um, yeah. but isn't it more to do with the sensor? It's more to do with the sensor. So if he's still yeah. within a sensor range... You know, yeah, I've, got, I've got no problem with that not being a penalty. It's the sensor, 100%. If it doesn't trip the sensor and you've lined up in the box properly, it's not a jump start. Although there are those who would argue that somehow his penalty got sent to Magnuson by mistake. Fair enough. And so I'm left with a, a thing of the weekend. Um, we've got a bit of uh, Danny Rick defences going on in the live chat as well. Joe Crawford says, oh, wow, Sonoda... Got five second penalty after the race, was 15th, not 14th. So he lost six places today and the slowest fast lap. But Danny's getting all, all the heat. Well, OK, well, you know, it's never a strong sign when to defend your driver. You have to talk about how badly another driver also did. That's not always the strongest footing to, to go on. And I don't know why I read out your full surname. Sorry, just didn't recognise it. First names only. No more surnames ever on the stream. And then uh, you can be guaranteed that if you join them in the Missed Apex chat, which I think you should, and get our uh, extra worse content and an ad-free feed, I think you should do it. Patreon.com forward slash Missed Apex. I am going to give my thing of the weekend to McLaren in general because I don't think they've come out with the best car the car that their fans hoped they would have but they're getting everything else right they're getting it right they do have a good car they do have a good platform they have a high downforce car that can go through high speed sections like race cars are meant to and they can go racing and piastri look great today as well and whenever they get these low wear tracks they're going to cash in because they're just they're a good team with good drivers and i think when they get these opportunities they're not going to fluff them. So I think that McLaren's one of the teams I've been most impressed with. Do we have any other things of the weekends or missed apexes? I mean, I mean, I guess Leclerc got a podium. Yay for him. Oh, yeah. Oh, Leclerc didn't look that sad today. That's no, he got didn't. to be a thing of the weekend as well. Yeah. Sergeant stayed behind Albon for a huge chunk of time. That's uh, not bad. Yeah. And as like, we know, we, right we praise... We praise Sergeant if he's close to Albon, don't we? So that's yes. okay. Good. Well, well done, Albon, as well. If you've got any feedback for us, always feel free to get in touch. Feedback at mistapex.net. Look in the show notes below. Follow us on all the things. Look out for some midweek content. We will respond to any breaking news that might come out on Monday evening or Tuesday morning. But until we see you next, work hard, be kind, and have fun. This was Mistapex Podcast. Thank <laughs> you.